And Dennis, you're on. Okay, well, good morning and welcome to the Cushion Report for October of 2024. And at the end of today's presentation, you'll have an opportunity to participate in our question and answer session. And we should it should be very interesting today with the topics we have. So today we're going to take a look at key economic indicators, the global economy, the domestic economy, mergers and acquisitions, and other significant economic news. And today, uh, what's ahead in 2024, we're going to take a look at mergers, acquisitions, and divestitures. And then we're going to take a look at mergers and acquisitions that failed, some of the most significant ones in our, in our country's history in business. So let's take a look, for example, at the merger and acquisition scenarios today. So, you know, there are a variety of economic and governmental and medical factors that will dictate the activity of the merger and acquisition market. Mergers and acquisitions basically play a vital role in our economy. They enable uh, companies to expand their base of business in existing markets and to penetrate strategic markets to generate new business and expand their footprint and gain or increase their competitive advantage. Mergers and acquisitions are both changes in control of companies that involve combining organizations and their operations of multiple entities into a single company or corporation. And there are times when the transaction is completed, the acquiring company will spin off or terminate non-strategic or losing operations. So what is an acquisition? Again, an acquisition is really defined as a corporate transaction where one company purchases a portion or all of another company's stock or shares or assets of the company. And acquisitions are typically made in order to take control of and build on the target company's strengths and capture their synergies. So why would you merge? Well, acquisitions often offer the following advantages in acquiring a company. First of all, they reduce entry barriers. So with M&A, a company is able to enter into a new market and product lines instantaneously with a brand that is already recognized with a good reputation and an existing client base. An acquisition can also help to overcome market entry barriers that were previously challenging. You have market power, and that is an acquisition can help to increase the market share of your company quickly. Even though uh, competition can be challenging, growth through acquisition can also be helpful in competitive market edge and also in the marketplace. You have new competencies and resources. Well, a company can choose to take over their other businesses to gain competitive and resources it doesn't really hold currently. So that uh, doing so really provides some benefits such as rapid growth in revenues and profitability, and also improving efficiency of operations. You have access to experts. So for example, when a small business would join with a larger business, they're able to access specialists such as financial, legal, uh, human resources, et cetera, to help grow the business. You have access to capital. So after the acquisition is done, you have access to a larger company, which improves your financial base with cash flow. However, with an acquisition, there's always the availability of even a greater level of capital once you combine the assets of the firm. And then you have fresh ideas and perspectives. M&A really offers and helps to provide teams of experts with fresh views and perspectives on how passionate they are about growing and expanding the business. However, there are challenges with acquisitions, as we all know, and many of them create disadvantages to your company. So, for example, you have cultural clashes, which is really a key one. And that is a company usually has its own distinct culture that has been developing since inception. So you have an acquiring company that has culture. Uh, those conflicts with yours became and will become problematic. You have a duplication. In other words, when the acquisition may lead to employee duplicating each other's duties. And when two similar uh, companies combine, there may be cases when you have duplications of operating areas within the company. You have conflicting objectives. Two companies involved in an acquisition may have distinct objectives that since they've opened are individually different than before the, co the combination of the two firms. Then you have conflicting objectives. And that is two companies involved are, are basically may have distinct objectives, different differentiating. Poorly managed businesses. Well, in this case, a business that doesn't look for an expert advice when trying to identify the most suitable company to acquire really may end up targeting a company that brings more challenges to the equation and benefits. And we'll see that later in some samples. Pressure on suppliers. Following an acquisition, the capacity of the suppliers of the company may not have enough 
to provide additional services, supplies, or materials that will be needed. They may create a problem in the production capacity problem area. Then you have brand damage. That is, an M&A transaction may hurt the image of the new company or damage the existing brand of the, the existing company. So what, what is a merger, really? Well, it, when you look at a merger, really, a merger is referred to as a financial transaction in the case where two companies join together and continue operations as one entity. And generally, that takes different categories. Perfect example of this would be American Airlines acquiring Hawaiian Airlines. So you've got that, now you have one company remaining. The same thing with United and American buying different companies, if well. So you have a horizontal merger, and that is merging companies are direct competitors operating in the same market or industry and often have similar products and services. And again, there's the Alaskan Airline deal. You have a vertical merger, which takes place a lot these days. These are merging companies operate within levels within an industry, uh, have the same supply chain line. For example, in the oil and gas industry, you may have an exploration and production, distribution, and thus transportation products for retail access, such as a gas station. So you go all the way down from the gas station, all the way up and down to the corporation in terms of exploration and development. Then you have market extension, and that is merging companies offer, uh, a lot of times, merging companies will offer compatible products and or services, but operate in different markets altogether. And then you have a product line extension. That is where uh, companies operating in the same market often have products and services that are complementary to one another. And then you have a conglomerate merger, such as merging companies offer completely different products and or services. So really, there are some really creative values for companies. So for example, one key is called synergies. And that is you combine two companies can create synergies that result in cost savings, increased efficiency, uh, increase revenue, eliminate duplication of functions, and really streamline the operations, resulting in lower cost profitability. And one of those companies that's been very successful over the years has been Cisco Systems in the Bay Area and also Oracle. You have market share. In this case, uh, mergers and acquisitions can help companies increase their market share by uh, acquiring other competitors. Diversification, which is really key in today's environment, mergers and acquisitions can help diversify product lines customer base and geography uh, reach of a company by reducing the risk of relying on a single product line. An example of that is some of the deals that have done by Amazon to expand into different markets. Then you look at talent acquisition. This is a real key element, and that is mergers and acquisitions can help companies acquire talented employees and executives, providing a competitive advantage in the marketplace. A lot of times these companies don't have the skill sets they need, and when they do, it fits together really well. You know, it, it really, the M&A deals really depend on, on some other factors that are really critical. So first of all, you have strategic fit. The companies involved must have complementary strengths and weaknesses and can be leveraged to create value. That is really a key element. Again, as we talked about earlier, cultural fit. You have effective due diligence, and that is uh, thorough due diligence is the process which is essential to identify any risks or problems that could derail the deal whether they be financial, legal, or operational. You've got effective integration, and many companies fail here, and that's a thorough, thorough situation where after the deal is closed, effective integration is essential to ensure that the two companies can operate as one single entity. And that includes integrating systems, process, and operations, and managing employees and customers. That's a very tight road to fold. You've got strong leadership, and that is a case where a successful merger and acquisition requires strong leadership from both companies to take the company to the next level. Clear communications results in a lot of downfalls of companies. Communication is really key to a successful merger and acquisition. And then you've got flexibility. And that is the integration process can be unpredictable. Thus, companies must be willing to adapt and make major changes. So a lot of these are faults that companies run into, which really hurts them. Now, we talk a little bit about a corporate divestiture and another strategy deployed to remove some of the uh, group's assets under its business portfolio. So a, really, a divestiture is a process of a company that is selling off or otherwise disposing of a business unit or an asset. In other words, it, it does, it's a losing proposition. It no longer fits in their product line. They decide to remove that asset from their portfolio. Now, when you decide to acquire a company, you really must consider buying the company for the right reason. 
Often companies are targeted and acquired for the wrong reason, leading to difficult outcomes, and in some cases, a pure disaster, which we'll see coming up. The acquiring company often has to rationalize the deal, which can be based on irrelevant data and rationale. Now let's take a look at some of the mergers and acquisitions that failed. I found a database that had a lot of them, but these are some really interesting ones. So AOL and Time Warner in 2000 merged. And what happened was, is that the merger was touted as a revolutionary move combining traditional media and the internet. However, the cultural classes, mismanagement, and the bursting of the dot-com bubble led to significant losses resulting in the split of the companies in 2009. Then you had Diamond Benz and Chrysler in 1998. The merger aimed to create a global automotive powerhouse. However, differences in corporate culture and strategic vision led to operational issues and inefficiencies, resulting in uh, selling off Chrysler in 2007 for a fraction of the original price. Then we have HP and Compaq, which is, should be known by everybody. That occurred in 2002. The merger aimed to consolidate the PC market, but it faced significant integration issues and internal dissent. Ultimately, it failed to deliver the expected synergies. Then you have eBay, which bought Skype in 2005. And uh, eBay acquired Skype to enhance their communications between their buyers and their sellers. However, the integration did not work as planned. And eBay eventually sold Skype in 2009 for less than it paid for it, leading to a lot of criticism of the company's leadership. Then we have Yahoo and Tumblr in 2013, and this is where Yahoo purchased the company for $1.1 billion, hoping to tack into uh, its young user base. However, the integration was poorly executed, and the company struggled uh, under, under the management of Yahoo. And then we have Sprint and Nextel, and in 2005, the merger was expected to create a competitive teledunk giant. Instead, but because of cultural differences and technology mismatches, the operation failed. Then we have Microsoft and Nokia. And uh, Microsoft acquired Nokia Mobile Division to strengthen its position in the smartphone market. The deal resulted in significant financial losses and was considered a major failure, leading to the eventual sale of Nokia assets. Then we have Qu Quaker Oats and Snapple in 1994. Here, Quaker Oats purchased Snapple for $1.7 billion, but struggled to manage the brand. And after a few years, they sold Snapple for $300 million, making this a significant financial loss to the company. Google and Motorola Mobility, a deal in 2012 for $12.5 billion. Motorola's sales remain unprofitable with revenue falling and the inability to secure sufficient distribution from telecom companies further slowed the performance. And then we have the big one, and that is where Bank of America and Countrywide merged in 2008. They were acquired. And what happened was this was a $4 billion deal. Well, Countrywide ran into serious financial trouble during the mortgage crisis meltdown in 2008. And then Countrywide struggled to get money to fund its operations when the market for mortgage-backed securities crashed. Ultimately, Bank of America had to pay $17 billion settlement fees to the government and later because of uh, Countrywide's role in the mortgage crisis turned into a complete disaster to, for the company. So these are some examples and illustrations of well-intentioned mergers and acquisitions that falter due to cultural classes, uh, poor integration, and shifting market conditions. So, you know, it sounds good to see A company buy B company, and everything is going to look green. And then what happens is highly, at the most part of these, a lot of these fail, and you never hear from them again. They're either spun off or they're closed. So that's that's where we are in the merger and acquisition field. Now let's take a look at the economic indicators. So let's take a look, for example, at the key economic indicators today. We're going to look at the gross demand product, inflation, unemployment at the federal and California level, and the price per barrel of oil. If we look at the global economy projection for 2024, it's still looking like 2.9%. That's where they are. And then I'll drop down to about 2.8 next year. The U.S. economy is looking to go out around 2.3 this year and then dropping down to 2.2 next year. Inflation right now um, is still, the last database we had was 3.1%. Uh, 
Uh, it's, uh, we'll talk about that a little bit later in the presentation. And then dropping down to 2.6 next year. The U.S. unemployment picture right now is looking to go out around 3.9% this year and then escalating to 4.2 next year. And, and again, economists still see a softening in the economy. And the California economy is looking at going out at unemployment with 5.1% this year and 3.9 next year. Now, the price per barrel of oil is interesting. It keeps on vacillating back and forth. Uh, the target right now looks somewhere between $72 and $85 a barrel, and that'll change as we'll see some more economic indicators coming out in December for the oil industry for next year. Now, let's take a look at some things in the global economy. So first of all, the European Central Bank uh, has had back-to-back -back rate cuts. Overall, they've dropped it uh, 25 basis points, the grand total of now 3.25%. So there, we're seeing rates coming down there. Swiss National Bank and the Reserve Bank of New Zealand both cut rates by 25 basis points. Now looking at the China's economy, China's economy continues to struggle, and the authorities have highly publicized stimulus, uh, to make a lot of stimulative investments over the next several months. Their economy is projected to go out this year around 4.6% and around 4.3% next year. So the, their economy is struggling. And then we have the Bank of Canada uh, took some judicious action and they dropped their basis points by 50, getting down the rate of 3.75. So most of these are moving in the right direction by dropping rates. And of course, if we look at the Second quarter GDP, which was a really a surprise for us, it was it was at, went on around 2.8 percent, which is very very strong. Now keep in mind, our third quarter ended in September. We probably won't see any information until sometime the latter part of November for the third quarter. But we'll have that when we have our next presentation. And again, the econ California economy uh, continues to struggle. What we're seeing notably in manufacturing, finance, and technology sectors within California are really going through some tough times. Also, the impact of last year's strike in the Hollywood industry continues to linger on. So we've had some really solid bumps in the road, and that, that will continue for the foreseeable future. And what's interesting, a lot of these uh, are full and part-time jobs. We talked about inflation. Uh, U.S. inflation rose a little bit in September, 2.4%, a little bit higher than expectations. And again, Keep in mind there's certain variables such as food, rent, and gasoline are not included in the fundamental calculation. However, in the area of wholesale prices, inflation went up by 2.8%, much higher than anticipated in the market by the economists. When we look at trade exports, the good news is they, they increased by 2%. So we saw them go out around $272 billion in August. So that was a good month there. A lot of shipments taking place in uh, pharmaceutical preparations computer accessories and aircraft were the real drivers in that, that area. The trade deficit, on the other hand, the good news is, even though it was at $70 billion, it was much lower than the $78 billion that we saw in July. So it's moving in the right direction. Retail sales had a great month. Uh, they surged a four-tenths of a point in September. Retail sales were up for food and, and uh, drinks and everything else. So we had a really good month in the retail economy. And as we get ready for the holiday season, it should even pick up more. So expectations are we're going to have a strong holiday season for Christmas coming up. Now let's take a look at the payroll situation, employment. Now we look at payrolls increased by 254,000 in the month of September, but the unemployment rate remained at 4 point, actually decreased to 4.1% from 4.2 the previous month. If you look at the sectors, uh, the good news is construction is continuing to have a very strong sector. 25,000 jobs, health and education is still growing, leisure and hospitality. And unfortunately, look at manufacturing, lost about another 7,000 jobs. So they're still in the contraction mode. And then retail saw a decline of 16,000. And transportation and warehousing was down too, about 9,000. Now, here we saw California economy with modest growth. And a lot of these jobs, what I've heard, some of these jobs are really part-time as well. But the unemployment picture, look at the number, it, it remained at 5.3% in September. So we have October, November, and December to see if that's going to come down or, or go in the same direction. Just a couple of data points here. Information services, which is in the tech sector, again, 5,100 jobs down. Leisure and hospitality were down 2,400. Uh, health and safety, health and education were up by 8,900. 
So it's not a lot of activity during the month. Very soft month in September. I mentioned interest rates. Uh, the good news is the Federal Reserve Open Market Committee uh, met and they dropped interest rates by 50 basis points. So we're seeing that drop then that that should do some that should help us a bit. Um, right now in November, they'll meet again and the target would be 25 basis points cut again in the month of November. However, uh, there's concerns about inflation and there's concerns about the job market. So we'll ha have to wait to see how all these variables come together in the middle of November to decide what the next steps will be. Uh, when we talk about mortgage rates, I just got something from this morning from last night. Uh, mortgage rates are now at 7.0%. They were at 6.60% about a week ago. They just moved up to 7% this morning. This is the average 30 year fixed. So there's all kinds of ups and downs depending on the criteria. And I think Lana knows about that. We'll mm -hmm. talk a little bit about that when we go to Q&A. Uh, the manufacturing index I've mentioned to you before, the manufacturing PMI was at 47.2 last month, relatively flat. And keep in mind, the reading below 50 indicates that manufacturing is still in a contractive mode. And it's been that way for several months, at least 10 or 11 months. So that's got to change for our economy. Now we look at factory orders. Uh, factory orders eased about two tenths of a point last month. Uh, in the month of August, excuse me, it was down about 500, it was up to $590 billion. Small business confidence level inched up a little bit by three tenths of a point. It's running around 91.5. Keep in mind, it's, it's still declined. Uh, it's been down over the past two years. We're looking to get that number up to, uh, to 100 basis points. That's really key. We look at consumer confidence. Um, it fell nine, to 98.7. It's the largest drop we've seen in month to month since August of 2021. And that's a lot of that is based on the assessment of the economic conditions and the outlook over the next six months in the economy. We look at crude oil prices. Um, they uh, they went up this morning. They're at $68.50 a barrel. Remember that we have a target of 72. It keeps vacillating. A, a few days ago, it was down at $63 a barrel. So it's up and down. Uh, it just depends on what day it is of the week when we, we get the data. The housing market, single housing, uh, housing starts drop five-tenths of a point in September, prime, uh, prime a little bit of kickback that we saw in August. And then we look at new home sales. Well, new home sales jumped 4.1% in September across the country, clearly easily topping consensus around the country of expectations. So that was very good. Now, let's take a look at Southern California. So in Los Angeles, the median price of 960000 that's the product on the market, increased by 4.4% in September, but sales dropped by 6.8% from August and down 2.5% from September of 2023. In Orange County, the home price medium was 1397000 and that dropped by two-tenths of a point in September. Sales were down 10.4% from August, but sales did increase by four-tenths of a point from September of 2023. And we'll finally, we look at San Diego, and that is the median price of a San Diego home now, if you can believe this is on market, is $1 million, down one-tenth of a point. But September sales were down by 14.6% from August, but up 9.4% for September of 2023. When we look at existing home sales, and there's some people here that this is important to hear, the total existing home sales declined by 1% in, in the month of September. Uh, very short of expectation. So uh, right now, the, the that marketplace uh, is the slowest growth we've seen since 2010 when we had the big recession. So it, it did slow down substantially, but there's still a lot of activity. When we look at construction spending, it was off by one-tenth of a point. That's the third month in a row we've seen in decline. And when we look at productivity, the third quarter data is not available at this time. We should have something in late September, especially available for January. Now, taking a look at company displacements, the good news is there weren't as many as we've seen in the past. Now, Hawaiian Air and the merger concluded, and the 1,400 jobs were eliminated as a result of the acquisition. General Electric laid off another 900. Cisco Systems, 4,000. CVS, which is closing a lot of stores and, and using a lot of new technologies, 2,900. Johnson & Johnson, 3,000. 
Boeing, as you know, you're close to right now, 17,000. Intel in Oregon, where Henry is, 1,300. Uh, Airbus, Defense and Space uh, will eliminate 2,500 2, jobs by the end of 2026. And then PPG coatings in Ohio, uh, 1,800. So that kind of takes you through where we were on some of the company displacements. Now let's take a look at the M&A marketplace. Again, it's been very, in spite of the rates out there right now in, in the marketplace for funding, there's still a lot of activity. And the deal with Alaska Airlines acquiring Hawaiian Airlines for $1.9 billion. So the programs will be combined and they'll continue to, to, to service Hawaii. General Mills is selling off its North American group, which is the yogurt business. It includes Yoplait, for those of you that like that, for $2.1 billion. They're seeing a continuation of the last several years of, of weakening sales and eroding market share. Motel 6, for anybody that's ever stayed at Motel 6, the entity has been sold to Indian-based oil hotels for $525 million. And that, that's an interesting all-cash transaction. So we've got that firm taking place and moving into the marketplace in the United States. PepsiCo is acquiring tortilla chip maker Sieta Foods for $1.2 billion dollars. Uh, this is the first deal that they've done in over five years. And then we have uh, MasterCard. So MasterCard basically is, is, is expanding their security service group by acquiring recorded future for $2.65 billion. This will enhance them. As you know, credit card fraud, et cetera, for all of the companies has been, it's been a real problem over the last several years. Sam's Club and... Uh, Excuse me. Sam's Club and Walmart are merging supply chains to improve overall operating efficiency and reduce operating costs. So I, th I think that's a very good move on their part. Then we have Marsh and McLean, which is a large insurance company. They're acquiring McGriff Insurance Services for $7.75 billion. Essentially, uh, it's a leading provider of insurance brokering and risk management services in the United States. And then we have, uh, let's see, after marshmallows. Okay, we have that. Now let's take a look, for example, at, uh, let's see. Then we have energy buyer Grace Mill Energy is, is being acquired for $5 billion. TPG, which is a major investment banking group, is buying energy company Tecron for $7.5 billion. And then finally, Dr. Pepper is buying a company called Ghost. And they're now moving into the energy drink uh, distribution center to move. Uh, Ghost is one of the fastest growing uh, categories in the area of expanding the portfolio for those for those types of energy soft drinks. So they're moving in that direction. So that's a major, major acquisition by Dr. Pepper. Terms of the deal were not announced. Now let's take a look at what else other economic news there is. So all of us are familiar with and our parents have been familiar with Tupperware file bankruptcy. And essentially, Tupperware is, is, is going to continue to operate on a voluntary basis as they go through the proceedings with a court approval and to focus on their customers. You have True Value uh, is filed for bankruptcy and they're selling itself to rival Do It Best. There's another acquisition in that, that particular market space. They Right now, they operate 4,500 4, independently owned retailers. And then we have Chipotle is replacing workers with robots to bypass California's minimum wage law. So what they've done, the company will shortly begin rolling out automated robots at some of their restaurants in, in the Golden State as a way of avoiding paying workers the $20 minimum. So they have something called AutoCado, which can, can peel, stone, and cut an avocado for guacamole in 26 seconds. So we'll see how this all works out. Southwest Airlines uh, announced that they're, they're laying off 300 pilots and flight attendants in Atlanta. They're going to continue to operate in Atlanta, but they're cutting the cost substantially, which was a, was a major surprise to Georgia. And UPS announced that they're preparing a 5.9% rate increase starting in December 23rd of this year. Taking a look at Walgreens, you're all familiar with Walgreens. Uh, they've uh, they've uh, announced that they're going to lay they're going to close another 1,200 stores in the drug industry due to really struggling to contend with online competitors and declining prescription drug payments. Now, I want you to think about this. Back in 2018, Walgreens had 9,508 locations. 
In 2023, they were down to 8,706, and they're dropping another 1,200. So they were they had just almost. It's it's amazing they continue to wind down of what's taking place. Now, one of the surprises in California is Phillips 66 announced they're shutting down the refinery in Los Angeles, and this will have an impact in California fuel. They're going to close at the end of the year. Uh, they represent 8% of California's oil. So that's going to have an impact on the price of oil in California going forward. The other thing that's interesting is major U.S. banks are on course to close a staggering 1,000 branches this year. And uh, again, they're consolidating all over the country. California will be the worst hit. They're looking at 86 branches being closed across the state. And then for those of you who are familiar with Denny's, announced that they're closing 150 restaurants, closures taking place, 50 by the end of 2024. Uh, Danny, Danny's plans to shutter these restaurants uh, aims to strengthen their cash flow position, so which is kind of a surprise. But you're seeing that happening a lot of the food chains across the country. So that kind of takes you through where we are today. And what I'd like to do now is to open up for questions and answers.